Hey guys, so today I'm going to tell you a story about how I built an electric bike rental company on an island in Mexico, all from the United States. You know, oftentimes when people give business advice or you listen to podcasts or you listen to, you know, TikTok videos or whatever, they give you pieces of advice, but they never tell you exactly how they used it. And I think that that's probably one of the things to me that was always the most frustrating as I was trying to grow in business was I would get this advice, but it wasn't like full. I never understood the exact story of how it was done. And I always thought if I understood that, it might help me. So today I want to share a detailed version of how this all transpired. So I'm going to start in January of 2023, this past year. My wife and my kids and I, we went to Cancun, Mexico. So each year we travel for three months, January, February, and March for the winter. And this past year, again, we chose Cancun. So whenever we go to a place or a different area, we try to experience as much of that area as we can, and we try to immerse ourselves in whatever culture that we're in. For those of you that aren't familiar with this, in Mexico, they have states just like we have in the United States. So Cancun is in a state called Quintana Roo. So we were looking for things to do in Quintana Roo that were not necessarily Playa del Carmen, Tulum, um, Isla Mujeres, some of the more famous things that people have heard of. So we we're Googling, we're looking each day, and we asked some of the locals, and everyone kept referencing a place called Isla Holbosch. Now, the first time I looked it up, it's actually spelled H-O-L-B-O-X, which is whole box is what I thought. But it's uh, it's pronunciated, uh, or yeah, you say it, I guess, whatever that word is. You say it, Isla Holbosch. So we decided that we were going to go visit for two days to this particular island. Now, this is about an hour and 50-minute drive from Cancun. Okay, so again, we still, even though we travel a lot, we still fall victim to listening to some of the news that we hear and how it can be dangerous. And, you know, in all honesty, in Cancun, if you've ever been, when you're driving in the hotel zone, it's absolutely amazing. The roads are great. But the minute you get outside the hotel zone, there's potholes everywhere. It might be three lanes, but there's five cars across and there's no stop signs. They use Uh, speed bump. So it's a little crazy and a little bit scary and intimidating knowing we're about to drive two hours in a spot where we really don't speak the language. So we take off and uh, we decide we're going to do it. So we, we head out. We get outside of Cancun about 15 or 20 minutes and we get on the highway. No exaggeration, no joke. Uh, It was probably the nicest highway I've ever driven on ever. It was nicer than any brand new highway I've ever been on in Chicago, anywhere, anywhere. So we were right out of the gate, blown away. So we're driving, we have beautiful scenery. It kind of looks like driving through central Illinois, uh, Missouri, some of those areas in the Midwest where it's pretty flat and just, it was just nice views. So we're on this highway speed limit, 75 miles an hour. And a really cool thing about Mexico, this is a side note, is they don't have police officers that are policing the speed limit, right? They have checkpoints. So you stop at these checkpoints and that's how they do it. So you can kind of, you know, drive as long as you're being safe, 75, 80 miles an hour and make up some pretty good time. So we get off the highway and now uh, within five minutes, we are on exactly what you expect these roads to look like, like a two lane road with no lines driving down the middle of it, nothing. People are just kind of driving everywhere. There's people riding bikes on the side of the road. There's all these little small Towns that, you know, I don't, I don't want to say that they were poverty, but um, they definitely, they didn't have things that we're accustomed to in America. That's probably the best way I can say it. So we drive through a few of these towns, and then uh, right before we get to the port city, which is called Chiquila, we went through our first checkpoint. So checkpoints in Mexico are pretty common. What they have is usually two to four police officers, and they, they're holding like kind of like what look like assault rifles or something, and they have bullets around their chest or whatever, and they stop you. Well, I speak enough Spanish to get around, but not enough to communicate with someone on something like this. So they pull us over. Turns out the license plates on our car expired. Ends up being a very, very scary situation because you don't really know what's going on. Um, Long story short on that, a bribery of, I think it was a thousand pesos got us out of it. And so that was about a hundred bucks, hundred US dollars. So we, we pay the bribe, they let us go. And uh, that took about an hour, by the way, for that to happen. But so Okay, now we're already nervous. We're a little uncomfortable about this whole situation, but we get to the the port city of Chiquila. You park. It's $5 per day to park. You just leave your car there. You have no idea what you're getting yourself into. And then you get on a ferry. Okay, so you, you buy these little ferry things on an app, the, or ferry tickets on an app. You get on this boat. 
And they drive you across. So again, we have no idea what to expect when we're heading to this place, but you know, we're excited. We get there, and the first thing that happens when we get off the ferry is you realize something. There are no cars on the entire island. It's all golf carts, okay? The taxis are yellow golf cart taxis. It was a really, really cool situation, and, and honestly, it was one of, the, one of my favorite places I've ever been to this day. But that first impression was like, wow, how different. And all the taxi drivers played loud music and uh, whatever. So we get there. Uh, we use the Google Translate app to tell them what hotel we're staying in. We booked all of that before we left. They take us to our hotel, and we pull up. And by the way, on this island, there are, uh, there are no roads with concrete, so everything is made of dirt. Very, very interesting and unique, but literally breathtaking. So we get to this to our hotel or resort or whatever you call it, and as you're walking in, and, I, you know, and I'll put some videos up here so you can see it, but literally astonishing at how beautiful and unique it was. I'd never seen anything like it anywhere that I've ever traveled in the world. So this was um, right out of the gate. It was awesome. What we, what we decided to do there is we had lunch there. Then we, you know, we get changed. We shower. We want to go out. We want to go to town. Well, if you don't take a golf cart taxi, you can rent a golf cart, and they rent golf carts for – it's $100 for six hours. It's kind of crazy, actually. And then all of these hotels, they have bicycles that they'll let you use for free if they're available. So they give us these two bicycles for my wife and I, and then we have two seats for the kids on the back – for, for the boys on the back of them. These bikes are total pieces of shit, okay? I mean, I actually think one of them, the, the back tire was like half flat, and you're driving on dirt. It was terrible. Well, my wife and I in Chicago, we have electric bikes. So we have some really, really cool electric bikes that we've had for years now, and we ride them when we're in Chicago literally every single day in the summertime. And they have, I don't know, 30 miles of range. They go about 25 miles an hour. They're so much fun. And Right when we started riding, I was like, man, what I would give to have our electric bikes here. My wife was like, same thing, right? So, again, we say that. Then we end up pedaling. We do our thing, whatever. We don't really talk about it. So, we get to the town. We tie our bikes up. And then we walk around. The place was magnificent. It was so, unlike anything I'd ever been to. It was just, it was like you had stores and roads that look like a, how would I describe it to you? It would, it would look like you're at a flea market on the street, but then you go in stores and it looks like you're, you're, you're on Michigan Avenue in downtown Chicago with these like high-end stores. It was unbelievable. And then you had the local market where you have the local handmade items. Amazing. Everyone on the island was as nice as you could possibly imagine. So we do this. We enjoy, the, we enjoy town. We go to dinner. And while we're sitting at dinner, my wife and I have plenty of time to just sit and chat the boys actually fell asleep, and we were watching people ride by on these bicycles. And I was like, man, you know, Mayor, I really think an electric bike business on this island would be awesome. And, you know, my wife's like, Chad, please, like, not another, not, not something else to get into, to take, you know, take your time away like this. And I'm like, you know, you're right. And something that happens to so many business owners today is if you have any form of success you will never be short on ideas that come your way from people that, A, want to partner with you or things that you see that you could improve. But one of the key things to remember about all of these businesses is that you're going to get out of them what you put into them. So if you put 100% of your effort in, you'll get 100% results. And if you only put 10%, that's all you can expect unless you can bring someone on and it can be their 100%. And you can be a partner in it where potentially your value add is consultation and funding. Okay. So those are the two, like the two, I, I would say outliers to shiny object syndrome as Alex Ramosi calls it. Okay. But so my wife says, no, you know, I just please, let's not get into this. I'm like, okay, okay, okay. So as the next day and a half went on and we're riding our bikes, she also mentioned it more than once. Like, man, it would be so amazing to have our bikes here. So then, you know, okay, whatever we leave, we go back, we, we, we get to our car, you know, we take the ferry back the next day we, or two days later, we leave and we get back to Cancun and, you know, we're sitting there, we're working, we're talking about it. And sure enough, it just kept coming up. And I'm like, you know, Mayor, I really think that this is an idea that's like not leaving my head. And I don't think it would be that difficult to do. And she's like, okay. So, you know, reluctantly she gives in. She says, it's fine. Okay. So now I have to make a trip back to the island and this time she's not going to go. So I decided to make a trip to the island and to stay for a day, and I just want to scout it out. I want to go out there, tr try and figure it all out. So the first thing I did was I took different taxis around the island. 
Okay, I would just go to a different place, get another taxi, get another taxi, and I would talk to the taxi drivers until I found someone that I just loved, that I thought they had great personality, everything, and then I thought, you know, that maybe I could ask them. So that's exactly what I did. I, I find this guy. His name was Jose. He spe- spe- spoke, sorry, spoke zero English. I was using my Google Translate app. Great personality. Played music the whole time. We just we chatted through the Translate app. I used the, a little amount of Spanish that I knew, and I just loved his personality. So I said, okay, this is the guy. So I said, hey, Jose, um, I came back here because I'm interested in starting an electric bike business on the island, and I want to show you some of my bikes, uh, photos of them, and see what your thoughts are. And he's like, oh, my God, it's amazing. I love this. Yes, I would love to partner with you on this. So I said, okay, great. So I said, I'm going to need to get – an office. I'm going to need to figure out the bikes. I need to figure out how to get them here. There's a lot of things I have to figure out. He said, okay, great. So I stayed for one day. I found Jose and I got his, I exchanged phone numbers with WhatsApp. So that's what everyone in Mexico basically uses to communicate is WhatsApp. So we exchanged WhatsApp numbers. And so now I'm super excited. Okay. Now also every time I travel, this is just a side traveler note for you guys. Anytime I go somewhere and I meet great servers or anyone that's great that I love chatting with or that has great energy, I always get their WhatsApp number. That way, if I'm ever there and I ever need something, I have people to reach out to and I build networks really, really fast this way. So that's just kind of a side traveler note. But so now back to this. So I get Jose's number. I leave. We're going to text now. He's going to put together some opportunities for us. And, uh, you know, I'm going to start figuring out what we can do for office space, things like this. So I get back to Cancun. I tell my wife and she said, you know, I would love it if you would bring a couple of people on. So there's a, there's a couple, uh, there's a guy that I've worked with on a few different projects. His name is Steve. And so I reached out to him and I said, Hey, you know, I went to this place. It was amazing. I want to start an electric bike rental company. And the crazy thing is he actually got some bikes that I bring in, um, that my wife and I have, I got him one and, uh, or two of them actually. And so he knows how awesome they are and he loves them. So he was like, instantly, I'm in. I'm in 100%. He's never been here, never seen the island, has no idea. So he's in. So the next week, we had some friends visiting from the United States, from Louisiana. And while we were at the hotel with them, I was sharing with them, you know, this idea that I had. And just like with Steve, they were like, hey, you know, I, I know you probably don't need it, but how would you like, you know, for us to be able to come in with you on this? And I was like, you know, that's actually. That'd be awesome. So this way we can split it in thirds. So we, okay, great. So first thing I do is I design the bikes to be in Mexico colors. So they're all white with a red fender and a green fender. And we decided to call it Holbosch Cruisers. Okay, so that's the name. So I have a big logo staff with my, um, with my poster company. And so the first thing I did was I sent this name over to them. They made a logo. It was amazing. It's, it's a really cool X on it. And we put cruisers in it. It's amazing. You'll see it. I'll put it, a, I'll post it up here. So we send that logo uh, to the bike guys and I put it on this design. And so instantly they get us back a few different samples of bikes. So we, the ones that I have are these 26 inch bikes and they're a little tall, especially for shorter people. They're a little bit harder to get on. So we thought, okay, we need 20 inch bikes also. Well, at the same time, they had a new product that they were getting ready to roll out that were like these giant scooters, okay? They have like bicycle tire, big one on the front, and then a smaller bicycle tire on the back, and it's a scooter, okay? But it's electric, and it goes 20-something miles an hour and has a 30-mile range, just like our bikes. So I instantly thought this would be amazing because you don't have to worry as much about people falling off of these or whatever. So we decided to go with three big bikes, Two, or I'm sorry, two big bikes, three medium-sized bikes, which are the 20 inches, and then 10 of the scooters to get started. So I placed this order with them, and we decide that we're going to ship them to Cancun. So the additional shipping cost for getting them to Cancun, and this is very important later for the story, was about $3,700 US dollars. Okay, so that's shipping them from the port to Cancun. So now we placed this order, and the first thing that I told Steve and I told Frank, I reminded them that... One thing I've never done specifically was bring something through customs in Mexico, and I don't know what to expect or how this is going to work or anything. But we do have a unique strategic advantage in this situation because my poster company operates eight locations in Mexico, and we have a partnership with a company there that they, they use our name, they license our software. So I talk to them literally every, almost every single day. So I was able to ask them if they would help me get it through customs. They said no problem. But again, they also had not brought something in but it was no problem. So we pay for the bikes. Uh, and, um, so now we, we have the bikes ready to go. 
So Frank was here. We agree on everything. He's good. They leave a couple days later. Well, I think six days later, I was going back to the island to look at some office space. And Frank decided to fly back from the United States to Cancun to ride back over there with me to see everything. So he and I go together. We get a really cool Airbnb. We're super excited about it. He gets in the ferry, loves it, okay? We, it's just such a good time. Like, the drive was awesome. We didn't get stopped at the checkpoint this time. It was amazing. We get there, and Jose is waiting on us. So I've communicated with Jose. I've put him in a group chat with Steve and with Frank. Everyone's excited, so we get there. Jose takes us to our Airbnb, says, you guys get settled um, this evening or like this early or late afternoon, early evening, I'm going to pick you guys up. I'm going to take you over to see the office space. So I said, okay, my wife goes, Hey Chad, just do me a favor. Don't get an office space until we look at a few of them. I said, yeah, no problem. Of course. First office space I look at it within five minutes, I have already used the app, uh, wise. It's, it used to be called transfer wise and I'd already wired the money. So to give you an idea as to what the office space cost on this Island, it was the only office that uh, we even that was even remotely close to what we could need that was even decent, okay? And this thing is maybe the size of a two-car garage, about 400 square feet, and it has a bathroom in it. And we pay, it's 30,000 pesos per month, which right now, I think it's about 17 to 1, so it goes for right around $1,800, $1,750 a month. And so I had to pay the first month's rent and the deposit, and we go, I think this is on like March the 25th or something, so uh, we're signing the lease for April 1st. So I wired this money instantly through TransferWise. It's in his account while I'm standing there next to him. Everything is great. He speaks no English, but again, we exchange WhatsApp numbers. I get in a group message with him, and we're excited. So now, um, you know, again, some things still have to work out, but at this point, we feel good. We have an office space, and we have bikes that are supposed to be delivered on June the 1st, and this is going to be April. It's going to be April 1st, so we have a couple months to get our office ready. Okay, so one of the rules that, <clears throat> that I had with everyone before they invested in this was, we could not bring America to the island, okay? We had to make the island better for what the island is because it's truly special and it's magnificent. It's one of the most unique places I'd ever seen, and I didn't want to bring America there. That was never the goal. It was how can I take what they do and make it unique and different and um, you know, add some value to the island for them and for the tourists and give people something to talk about. So we leave. Frank in love with the island. The minute we got there, everything, we had food. The food's so fresh. Most of it's grown on the island. It was amazing. We had a phenomenal time. So we leave. Now he's super excited. He, Steve, and I are chatting every day. We're deciding on things we're going to do. So now the bikes, they ship. They ship from China, and they're on their way to Mexico. Well, uh, this is when the first set of real problems happened. Okay, so the bikes land in Mexico, and uh, when they get there, the customs uh, department or whatever you would call it in Mexico, they knew immediately based on the way that we submitted paperwork that we had no idea what we were doing. And when you do something like that in Mexico, they can quickly take advantage of you. And that's exactly what happened with us. So we submit this paperwork, um, we do it wrong, and we had no idea that what we had done was this bad. Okay, so now we have to go through basically cancel all of the paperwork that we have, refile all of this paperwork, and uh, hope that we get it right. So now the bikes arrive are right around June 1st, okay? So we start canceling paperwork. We start filing paperwork. So we start giving all the things they need. And every day we got them something. They needed something else. So we're two weeks into this, and we realize that we're going to have to hire someone. So we reach out to someone, and they tell us, um, you know, oh, it's going to be, I, I don't know what the number was. It was, it was high. It's going to be a couple thousand dollars for them to refile everything. So we're like, okay, fine. We'll just do what we have to do. So we get this done. We file some paperwork and then we're missing serial numbers for the bike. So now we had to have serial numbers for the bike. Well, when we go back to China, they only had a couple of them. So this became a problem and it delayed everything. So now along the way, um, th this takes a full month at this point. We're still delayed. We've made no progress basically at all other than resubmitting paperwork. And it's super frustrating. And you kind of feel like it, you may have made a huge mistake because now I have, you know, people's money on the hook and I, I feel bad. And at the same time, we're paying an office and everything else. Well, okay, so, and again, the story is very detailed because I want you to understand all of it. So now, fast forward to July, like the 10th, I think it was, we were working with my poster company at an event in Florida. And um, there was a, a girl that works for us. And every year we let her come to the United States for a week. 
Uh, and she was able to come in and work with us. Her name is Salma. She's become a great friend of ours. She speaks fluent English. She's been my liaison in Mexico forever, and she's been absolutely nothing short of amazing. Again, worked with us for many, many years. So uh, she comes up, and her and I, one night, we go out to dinner, and we just wanted to chat about everything, all the stuff that we've done this last year with the poster companies, you know, things that she would like to see in her life. And keep in mind, she lives in an area called Morelia, which is in central Mexico, and it's one of the most drug-ridden uh, parts of Mexico. So it's very dangerous. She's a little daughter, and she's amazing. So we started talking about it, and instantly while we were chatting, I, I, I brought this idea up, you know, while we were going through stuff, and I said, you know, what are your thoughts on it? And she's, her idea was she would love to live in a place like that. Instantly it was like, hey, if you're willing to move here and help us out, we will cover everything. This would be one of the most amazing things ever. And it would make Frank and Steve feel even better because they've also met her. They know her. She speaks English. So this was it. So she said, yes, that's what I want to do. I'm in. Perfect. Okay. So now, now we're excited. Okay. Now my wife, it loosens a little bit of stress on her because again, she speaks no Spanish and she's known Salma. We've all known her for years. We've known her kid, everything. So this was perfect. So we head back. Um, Salma heads back to Mexico. We get in touch. We talk about Holbosch. Now, for her, she actually sold every single thing that she owned to move to the island. Okay, so we bought her plane tickets. We rented an apartment for her. She had to find everyone. We introduced her to Jose. Again, lots of chatting. She's never even been to this place. The first time she went there, she moved there with her four-year-old daughter. That's how amazing she is. Okay, and she also wanted a better life for herself, and she saw this as a great opportunity. So, she gets to, well, first and foremost, she gets to the island August the 1st. I think it was the 1st or the 2nd or something like that. And at this point, we thought we were going to have the bikes every single week in customs. Every single week, they told us, okay, just get me this, and then we can ship it out. Just get me this, and we can ship it out. Okay, okay, we get them that. It's something else. It's something else. Then they dropped the bomb on us that um, essentially to get these things through storage or through customs and the storage that we've had to pay for the last two months was going to be basically 10000 U.S. dollars. So I'm like, oh, shit, of course. So um, what do you do? Like, what do you do, right? You pay it. That's what you do. So we pay the $10,000 for the storage fees. They tell us they're going to release the bikes the next day. They're going to pick them up. Perfect. Um, so the next day, the trucking company gets there. Uh, Customs has not released them yet. So they take two more days to finally, quote, unquote, they said release them. So then the trucking company gets back there two days later. And... Um, Customs calls us and says, we have two more days of storage. But this time, they charge us, I think it was like $250 per day for the storage. It was in something insane. So at this point, I'm super upset. We're trying to talk with our broker, explain all of the situation to him. He's trying to help us out. But again, he's like, well, you must pay it. So we pay it. Then the trucking company tells us that they can't take the bikes because they're electric bicycles and they have batteries and they need some documents from China. So we get these documents from China. Again, we get it to them. They show up ready to pick the bikes up. They don't have a big enough truck. Okay, so they leave. They come back the next day. Customs calls us as we have to pay storage fees. So now, after we keep going through this vicious cycle, we decide to hire our own company to get the bikes out of customs and into a warehouse in a port town called Manzanillo. So apparently this is where everything has to go through. We didn't know. We weren't really sure. So we get these bikes. We get someone to finally pick them up. They get them to this port or to this uh, warehouse area. So we're super excited. It felt like a huge weight because in all honesty, truth be told, what I thought had happened was they saw these bikes. They saw how cool they were and they decided to steal them and then, or, you know, or sell them. I didn't really know, but um, just keep them. And so this way we wouldn't have them and they try to charge us these crazy fees. So then we would eventually give up, but that was not happening. We were, we were, as we call it pot committed. We are all in on this. So we end up getting them in this warehouse. The warehouse tells us that they will, um, they will deliver them to Cancun for us. Okay. But we've already paid $3,700 to this Chinese company that, you know, they're going to take care of the forwarding. Well, it turns out the company they paid not going to happen. They're not paying it or they're not picking them up. They're not delivering them. So that money, we're out. We reach out to them. Uh, on uh, we reach, I reach out to them. They tell us that they'll give us like twelve hundred dollars of the money back. Absolutely insane, but whatever. It is what it is. So then we hire a company to bring the bikes to Cancun. So the bikes end up in Cancun the first week of September, I think it was. They ended up in Cancun. 
So now we're so excited they made it to Cancun. Now they're going to deliver them to someone that uh, Salma, who's now living on the island, has found someone who lives in Cancun who will bring the bikes to us. So they're going to deliver them to her. Well, when the bikes get delivered, the person that they delivered them to opened them, okay? And he looks at them, takes the box out, okay? So imagine your Amazon driver literally opening your package and looking at what you have, okay? And after they looked at it, he decided that instead of charging us 7,000 pesos to deliver the bikes, now it was going to be 14,000 pesos to deliver them because he saw what they are and he knew that we desperately wanted them. So, uh, of course, we're <laughs> just another one of those things where I'm just relieved that the bikes are whole. I saw my first photo of them. I, I don't know. Salma ends up uh, finding someone else that agreed to do it for 8,500 pesos. We call the guy that has them, and we said, listen, we can get them done for 8,500 pesos, so that's what it's going to be. He's going to charge us a crazy storage fee. And I said, look, if you can get them there by the next day at noon, we will give you 10,000 pesos to deliver these things. It's like basically $600. Long story short, those things were on the ferry the next morning. So the way it works in Holbosch is when you drive on or when you drive to the port town, they have two ferries. They have one ferry that takes people. And then they have another ferry that vehicles that have supplies for restaurants and construction and things like that, you drive your vehicle on and then they take you across, you drive off and then you do your stuff and you drive back on and they take you back. So we had no idea this was going to happen. So the next morning, sure enough, 7 a.m., they message Salma. They say, hey, we're on, the, we're on our way. We're on the ferry right now on our way. They drive there. They unload them. And even the bike that was uh, they'd already opened, that one was all there with all the pieces. Everything worked out great. So finally, we have the bikes on the island. Now, in the meantime, while we were waiting, once Salma arrived on the island, the 1st of August, for the next month, what we did was we hired local people to do some things. One of the things that we did, we wanted to put bamboo sticks on two sides of the walls that go all the way around, or that cover the whole wall on two sides of our office. And we wanted to do this because, again, it's all about fitting into the culture of Holbosch because it's so unique and so interesting so again, we hire this guy, he cuts these bamboo sticks, makes it. You'll see the pictures right up there. I'll put them, I'll put them in this podcast here. But absolutely breathtaking work that they did. The same guy then built us some A-frame uh, sandwich boards that we put in. And again, for these things, they didn't charge much. It was great. But they built these A-frames for us that we can now put signage on and stuff like that. So the next step was... We have to get the bikes put together. So that's something Salma, she said in her whole life, she's never even put two Legos together. So Salma and I spent all this time on FaceTime getting the first scooter together, and she nailed it. Like, absolutely perfect, absolutely amazing. And we get this thing together. She takes it outside. And for the first time since, you know, the idea happened in March, uh, 1st of March, I guess it was, for the first time, we rode a scooter on the, or a bike scooter on the island, and it was such an amazing experience. So then the next couple of days, Salma put the other 14 remaining uh, bikes and scooters together. Then we hired someone from Cancun to come out and do video and drone uh, photography. So this way we could build an amazing website that really harnessed and showcased what the island was all about and why these bikes would really enhance your experience on the island because you can take these electric bikes everywhere. And the island itself, I want to say is like seven miles and there's it's seven blocks for sure across the island. So you could drive all over this place and have no issues with battery and just really, really enjoy the experience. And these bikes make it effortless. And, you know, during obviously this is an island on the equator and so it gets warm. So driving this way is the, is the exact opposite of pedaling a bike in sand. It's hot, it's hard, it's difficult, especially when you have kids in the back. But these electric bikes, you push your thumb down and you're cruising. So absolutely super excited. So now while we were, or while well, I say we, you know, at this point, I, I still haven't even gone to the island yet. I haven't gone back to this moment right now. I still haven't. But as we get the bikes on the island or we get them assembled and we get this guy there who's going to do the photos and everything, we take a lot of the bikes and Jose puts them in his taxi. He has a taxi still. Puts them in his taxi. We take some of them to the beach. Salma, her boyfriend, flew in. They rode them to the beach. And uh, we filmed all of this amazing footage. We took amazing photos. And it turned out to be 10 times better than I could have ever imagined it would be. 
Along the way, we built a simple website to harness everything that allows us to offer rentals by the day, you know, for ranges. And we built it all through Shopify. Shopify is not sponsored in this by any means, but we built it through them. We used a free theme and it was absolutely perfect. So if you guys get a chance and you can look at the site, I'll put it in here. I'll put it in the description below. Be sure and check it out because hopefully you'll like it as much as we do. And yeah, so our opening day. So today right now is September the 24th. And our opening day is going to be October the 1st. And we could not be more excited. We've had so much buzz. There's about 1,000 locals that live on the island. Everyone likes it. We've reached out to Airbnbs, property owners, or, or, um, hotel and like resort owners. And they're all interested in partnering with us and offering it as a part of the rental for their particular items or for their particular Airbnbs or, again, like rooms and stuff like that. So, it looks like everything that we set out to achieve so far, we've done that. And so we will be opening October 1st. I will definitely do a follow-up, you know, within 90 days of opening the business to let you guys know how it's going, what type of revenue we're generating, how long it's going to take us to make our money back. The amount of money that we spent was, you know, we went into it thinking we would spend X and we spent three and a half or four times that, and we still haven't made any money yet, but we could have made money every single day since we've had them together, just so you do know. Uh, we've had people asking if they could rent them, but again, we had to have uh, terms and conditions, things like that. And what we're going to do our very first day, our first week, is we're going to set all of the bikes outside on the road, and we're going to allow free test run, like free test drives of the bikes, kind of like you would a car. So we're going to be able to go down the street, and we're going to have some cones. We can go down and circle and come back. And yeah, we really hope that this ends up being what causes this particular business to take off. But you can guarantee and rest assured that I will absolutely keep all of you informed. And when I do my follow-up video, I will give you some concrete numbers on just how well our investment's going and just, you know, what we expect for the future and what our growth plans are with it. So thank you guys for listening. I hope you find the story enjoyable. And if you, you know, you know an entrepreneur out there that might enjoy it, uh, please feel free to share it with them. Thank you.